I'm Joe Green, the lead pastor here, and it is so good to see you. Great to have you. If you can't see in the back, we have some seats up here in the front. That's for you. Thought I'd mention that. Be sure and sign the register at the end of the pew and pass that across if you would, and, and then pull out your, your uh, insert there in your bulletin. Just a few announcements. I want to mention that Wednesday night, Dan Chase is speaking, and he's talking about bees. You say, what in the world is that? Read that because you will not want to miss this. You say, I don't know. Yes, you will not want to miss this. Wednesday night, beekeeper Dan, you know Dan and Lisa, so, so be sure and check that out, okay? Also, want to mention uh, uh, that next weekend, the 27th, 8th, and 9th, is the crusade, the Will Graham Crusade at Freedom Hall in Johnson City. And that begins next Sunday evening, so I hope, I mean next Friday evening. I hope you'll make sure that you come to that. And if you'd like, you can come this evening at 6 to Freedom Hall and, and be a part of a prayer group there. So I hope you will get involved in what God is doing there. I also want to mention inside the bulletin, the Wesley Society Dinner, and Jim Welch is speaking, and that, that will be the 26th. And uh, Jim's always good. He's just one of the best you'll hear. And so I hope that you'll, you'll read that and come and, support, uh, come and support that group. That is great. That is awesome that, that we have, a, that have an opportunity to hear that guy speak again. Okay? So uh, just a couple other things, and Rick Curry is going to make an announcement. And Rick's always good, isn't he? <laughs> yes. I'm here to remind you that next Sunday is a fifth Sunday. And on each fifth Sunday, we have the opportunity to make a gift to Holston United Methodist Home for Children. Holston Home provides an array of services throughout the Holston Conference. It provides residential care for 200 abandoned, neglected, and troubled adolescents, boys, and girls. It operates a fully accredited campus school, supervises foster homes for almost 200 children and youth, provides adoption services, family counseling, counseling and quality preschool daycare in the Greenville area. And more importantly, all the programs demonstrate the love of Jesus to help children, youth, fam and families realize their God-given potential. So please come prepared next Sunday to give generously to this wonderful ministry. Thank you, Rick. Thank you. And then Mike Berry is going to come now and speak. Mike is head of our church leadership council, our CLC. And he's got an announcement to make. Thanks, Joe. Good morning. As you recall, a couple of months ago, Joe Green announced his retirement effective uh, this summer. So after 46 years of being a pastor and serving the Lord and serving the United Methodist Church, he certainly earned this retirement. We will miss his leadership, his passion, his personality, but at the same time, we wish Beth and Joe nothing but the very best as they enter the retirement years and can spend more time with each other and more time with their families. By the way, are you aware that he has grandchildren? Have you heard this? Okay. We have, uh, we have pictures and uh, videos if you're interested. In, uh, We're going to hand out pictures as you, as you exit uh, the area this morning, so feel free to take some, <laughs> give them to friends. This is also the time of year that the bishop and her cabinet uh, make appointments for the upcoming year. So on behalf of the Church Leadership Council, which we call the CLC, I'm pleased to announce that our next senior pastor will be Randy Fry. So many of you know Randy because he was a, a, an associate here from 1993 to 98. He's currently the senior pastor at Fountain City United Methodist Church in Knoxville. We have many connects to that church, including our very own Amy Acock, who's an associate minister there and works with Randy. So uh, stay tuned as we'll have receptions for, for Joe and also uh, for others coming up. Additionally, I'd like to make the comment that Harrison Bell has a new uh, appointment. He'll be moving to... Uh, Wheeler Methodist Church. That church is located across from the airport in Northeast State. And so uh, it's our loss. It's a gain for him in that he can continue his career path. He's well thought of. 
He'll be the senior pastor there and have a whole range of responsibilities that'll help his career path down the road. Uh, so that was a little bit of a surprise to us. So at this point, we're gonna have two appointed pastors who are Misty McCrary and Randy Fry. Going forward for the traditional service as well as the contemporary service, they'll be serviced by both pastors as they rotate. One other comment from the CLC is that we wanna make an, a change to the office hours of the church. As you can imagine, we have many people on staff here that work on Sunday and Friday's one of their normal days off. So if you're here in the church on a Friday, specifically Friday afternoons, there's not a lot of activity. So to help with uh, efficiencies and help our staff, we're gonna close the office on Friday afternoons. However, if you have a need to have an appointment with someone or to have a room or to be here, we'll, we'll gladly open the church up. We just wanna do it by appointment, uh, business model, if you will. And lastly, I'd like to say, this church has been richly blessed by God with the ministries of Joe Green and Harrison Bell. And we're, we're thankful for that. But at the same time, we also know that God will richly bless us in the future. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Mike. Uh, I know Randy Fry. He's a fairly nice guy. And uh, <laughs> so, no, he's a good friend of mine. And uh, you, you pray for him in this transition. He's had a great ministry down in Fountain City and done a great job down there. And, and pray for him and his family. And for Harrison. Uh, going to Wheeler is a great opportunity for him, great opportunity, and he's going to do a great job over there too. So we're thankful for, uh, for him and thankful for Randy coming. So uh, keep, keep those families too in your prayers. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it.
Amen. Thank you, Don and Ann. Good morning. I'm John Wilson, the interim minister of music here at First Broad Street. Glad to be with you today. The sunshine's been wonderful this week, hasn't it? Uh, you probably noticed in our bulletin we have several references to Psalm 23. This, uh, if you if you read the Bible every day and you want a method of reading the Bible, use the lectionary text. There, it's a three-year cycle. And if you start with year A and then go to BC, you've read the entire Bible at the end of three years. It's a great discipline. And always in May, there is a, uh, a Sunday that we call, that I call Shepherd Sunday, because it's a Sunday that the 23rd Psalm is read, and, uh, and then the text from John, I am the good shepherd, that beautiful text is in there. We're not doing those today. But it, uh, everything fits, it really does. Uh, and, but we're starting with a hymn that's written by uh, Joseph Henry Gilmore. It's written in 1861. He, uh, he was pastoring a church at First Baptist Church in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He just finished a preaching mission at his church and he sat down to, to write a hymn based on the 23rd Psalm. So he started writing, and he got to. The, he started writing, and he wrote the words, "He leadeth me," and never really got past that. He said those words were so just hit him so profoundly, and you know this is during the Civil War too. A lot was going on in the nation, and he 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 leadeth me stuck with him, and, and as he thought about it, and meditated on that, it uh, was so beautiful that the hymn is really about Jesus leading us and God leading us. He leadeth me. So let us stand and sing this great hymn, 128, He Leadeth Me.
Good morning. Good morning. Would you please join me in the affirmation of faith as pr printed in the bulletin, the Apostles' Creed, also printed in 881. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Welcome the children up for our children's message. Good morning, everybody. Ooh, what a good group we have this morning. Good morning. I'm glad to see you all this morning. Are you glad to be here this morning? Yeah, me too. Me too. It's a beautiful day. Okay. So I'm going to read our Bible verse that our message is going to be about today. Are you ready? It is from John 8. Is John, the book of John, in the Old Testament or the New Testament? New. It's the New Testament. That's right. We're working on that. So John 8, 12 says, Jesus spoke to the people again, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me won't walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So we're going to talk about light today. So is anybody afraid of the dark? A little bit sometimes? Well, if, if you're alone, it's not unusual to be afraid of the dark. It's definitely nothing to be ashamed of. Does anybody have a nightlight in your bedroom or in the hallway? Yeah. You have your lamp. Excellent. El elephant. Awesome. Closet. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Not elephant. It's the closet. Um, so it's actually a good idea. You have a dinosaur one. Awesome. Okay. It's a good one. I bet it is. So it's actually a really good idea to have a nightlight. Because what about if you get up in the night, you need a drink of water or something, and you go, if you didn't have a nightlight, you might stub your toe or something, right? And that wouldn't be very good. Yes, you call for mom, that works too, yeah. Um, so if you were ever to go for a walk at night, like outside in the woods or something, it's a good idea to carry a, a flashlight, right? So you can see, because even if you're not afraid of the dark, which some of you are not, even if you're not afraid of the dark, you could accidentally step into a hole and sprain your ankle or bump into something because you can't see. Mm. Yes, you could trip on a log that has fallen down. That's right. Cahill hurt his elbow in the dark one time. Yeah, okay, twice. All right, so <laughs> if you have a choice of walking in the dark or walking in the light, which would you choose? Light? I know that I would choose that. I actually have a really good example of that. So this is with our big kids. Friday night, we had a lock-in with our fourth and fifth graders, okay? So when you get to be a little bit bigger, that means you get to spend the night at church the whole entire night. And it's so fun. And one of the things that we always do late at night, we'll get, a, get our flashlights and we'll go on a walk around the church. And it's dark, but we all have our flashlights, right? 
So we're walking, we have about 15, 16 kids, so we have that many flashlights. Um, and it helped us to see, and it also helped us not to be afraid. And um, one little aside note, it actually might preach well in the future, I don't know, um, is I had a couple of kids that would stay super close to me because they felt better being close, right, when it was dark. And um, when we got into the sanctuary, uh, one child was particularly relieved because he said, I am so glad we're in here because this place is the safest place on earth that we could be because whenever evil spirits hit those doors, they just explode. <laughs> so we were super safe here, but that's another lesson. I don't know. Um, but anyway, you might be surprised to know that some people actually choose to walk in the darkness. So can you imagine that? Why would they do that? Because here's what Jesus says. He says, everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their evil deeds will be exposed. So every day, every minute, I would say, we make choices. Every second even, we make choices. And if we live by truth, we walk in the light so, it will be, so that we may be plainly seen. As Jesus said, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So who is the light of the world? Jesus is the light of the world. So what choice, and God, what choice will you make? Will you walk in light or in the darkness? Light, that's awesome. Oh. Uh, that's also another story. So why don't we sing, um, in closing, instead of say a pray, saying a prayer, why don't we sing um, this little light of mine? And can we, can we get the congregation to sing with us, do you think? Okay, let's just sing the first verse. Are you ready? This light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. And an explosion at the door, we are going to pray. <laughs> Isn't it great that our children are being taught? You know, that's awesome. That is awesome. We want to pray now, and I'm going to be at the altar. If you'd like to join me, please do. But uh, let us unite our hearts and approach the throne of grace with boldness, as the word says. Let us pray. Father God, the last three weeks at First Broad Street have been, uh, have been of seismic proportion. Easter with a celebration of the risen Jesus, confirmation with a celebration of our young people and, and the baptism of folks of all ages. And then last week as we celebrated the mission opportunities you placed in our hearts here at First Broad Street. So we are thankful, Lord, where well, we can sing that song, This Little Light of Mine, we're going to let it shine. And as a church, we're going to let it shine. Hallelujah. Today we continue to worship and celebrate you. We are constantly in awe of your majesty and power. What great comfort it is to know that it is you who guides us. It is you who protects us, who walks with us. And today, Lord, we pause to give thanks and meditate on your will for the church and for our lives as individuals. Keep us from being 
uh, of the world as we learn to navigate its dangers and its temptations. By your grace, we know our struggle is already won when we walk in faith with you. Father God, your glory is all around us. And especially, that's true, especially in this place, what wonder it is just to be alive. We thank you and we praise you. You are our refuge and strength. And in you we find peace and contentment, joy and hope. And may our witness, may our witness of you be rich and be contagious, Father. And may our joy truly be born of you. And we continue to pray for our country. We pray for our leadership, for President uh, Trump and, and those in Washington. We pray again for community leaders. We pray leadership in home and, and also in our schools, Father. Give them wisdom. Give them wisdom, Father. And, and I pray that uh, the hunger, the hunger that, uh, that they would have that can only be uh, satisfied in you, Father, I pray that uh, you would build that hunger among all of us, Lord. We pray for the sick and the hospitals. We think of Mary Ann Randolph and pray for healing and wholeness. We pray, Lord, in celebration of the birth of Jackson Edward Marshall, Philip and Virginia's uh, new baby boy and Lucy and Stella's little brother. We celebrate with, also with the grandparents, Debbie Howe and Danny and Noel Howe and a great-grandmother in Francis Howe, Father, and others, Lord, in that family. Just pray you continue to bless them and give them, uh, give, uh, um, give Philip and Virginia wisdom as they raise that child, this special, this new child for uh, the new addition to the family, but also the whole family, Father. Be with them. And Lord, we pray, we pray for... Um, for the Bush family and the loss of one of, our, uh, one of our first ladies and Barbara, and pray that you administer to the special needs that they have at this time. And Lord, we celebrate. We celebrate the fact that we can bring our concerns to you. There are others upon our hearts and lives. There's others, Father, that, um, that every time we uh, call out your name or kneel before you, they come to mind. And right now, we lift those up to you. And we celebrate Jesus who taught us to pray when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And now as we pause for a moment to reflect on the many gifts that have been given to us, let us also prepare our hearts for the giving of our tithes and offerings.
Father, thank you for the opportunity to give back humbly to you. May you use it to the glory of your kingdom. Amen. And now would you please join me in the prayer of illumination as printed in your bulletin. Guide us, O God, by your word and spirit, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover your peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from two readings. First, in the book of Psalms 32, verses 1 through 5. Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those who record the Lord has record as cleared of guilt, whose lives are lived in complete honesty. When I refuse to confess my sin, my body wasted away and I groaned all day long. Day and night, your hand of discipline was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. Finally, I confessed all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord, and you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. And from Romans chapter 7, verses 21 through 25, I have discovered this principle of life, that when what I do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart, but there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and by death? Thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. sent his son they called him Jesus he came to love heal and forgive he gave his life to buy my pardon an empty grave is there to prove my Savior Because 
God's people said, Amen. Amen. I think I taught her that song, by the way. I, I, I can't remember. Uh, 44 years, you know, 46 years. That's, uh, you'll find if you're a visitor, a visitor today, my outline is in your bulletin, and you can turn there if you would. You know, it seems in life that um, the one that I have the most trouble with in my life is me. You know that? That... Uh, um, they say that, I think it was a guy named Landon, a minister of a, a yesteryear, he said, when you find yourself uh, facing some great occasion in your life, the way you respond depends a whole lot upon who you are or what you have become. And, you know, we look at our world today and, and we see the challenges before us and, and we wonder and say, what in the world is going on. You know that, that with all of our technological advance and so many people, our children are savvy, tech savvy, you know, much more than we are, and yet we still see our problems mounting in homes and nations and struggles that, that people have, and we say, what, what is going on? I thought today I'd just simply share that with you. Uh, again, my, my outline is there in your bulletin. I hope you'll follow along with me. But... Um, Simple word, simple word today. Three points, and, and uh, we'll be eating lunch, okay? <laughs> but, but I think this is something that we need to be, uh, we need to hear, and we need to be reminded of this occasionally. You'll find a scripture there from Job in 7. Uh, again, why is life so hard? Why do we suffer? So let's, uh, let's consider this. The, uh, the reason... Uh, the, the results and, and the right response to this. So plug into this as we share today. First of all, the reason I have there for you, rebellion against God's broken everything. We live in a broken world. You heard me say that. That they say, you know, how come things don't work? You know, what's happened here? The world's broken. People say, how come, how come good people suffer? Or how come my children suffer and die? And, and, and good folks go through such uh, incredible situations. Why does that happen? Where are you, God? And, and yet you really stop and you look at, this world is broken. In the Garden of Eden, you can trace it all the way back to the book of Genesis, and you see that we live in, in a broken world. Uh, look again at Scripture, Romans 5. When Adam sinned, sin entered the entire human race. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone. For everyone sinned. So before death, there, or before sin, rather, no death. That's pretty cool. You know, as they say that, that, that when they walk past your casket and, and they say, my, he looks natural, I want to rise up and they say, my, he's alive. You know, that's, that's really what, but that doesn't work that way, does it? It doesn't work that way because we live in a broken planet, on a broken planet. Look again at scripture, Isaiah 53, familiar scripture. All. All of us, all of us, have strayed away like sheep. You don't have to teach a sheep to stray. That's natural, isn't it? All of us have strayed away like sheep. We have left God's paths to follow our own, that we've done our own thing, really. We've done our own thing is really what that scripture says. Even when we've known the right thing to do, uh, we do the easy, the easy things so often. Again, the scripture, Proverbs 20, who can say, I've kept my heart pure. I am clean and without sin. We've all broken God's laws. And we live in a broken planet, on a broken planet. So what kind of rebellion? Look again at your notes. Three kinds of rebellion. Sin. And, and as I say, the middle letter is I, isn't it? And, and the, the Greek word for that, that particular word is amartia, and it means to miss the mark. That's when an archer will take a bow and shoot an arrow. And he will miss the mark. And so often we quote sin. We miss the mark. Uh, a, a second a definition might be transgression. That's going beyond the set boundary. When you leave here, if you want to take a beautiful drive, drive to Middlesbrough by way of Lee County. You go down, you, you go down through that, that beautiful county and, and, and you, uh, you, you go to Duffield, you cut left, you know how to go. 
And, and you go into Lee County, and when you get to the, to the lower part, the western part of that, you're on this beautiful highway, this four lane, and you're the only one on the road. And, and, and you're going down and you say, this is so cool, what a beautiful place this is. And, and, and you're just there alone, it's pretty cool. And, and then you go, you're going to speed limit, which is probably 60 now, is it 60 down there now? 55, still 55 on a four lane. So you're going down there, you're going down there, I've, I've led people astray at the first two services, there'll be people. <laughs> I, I, uh, anyway, you're going down the highway and you're going 55 and you say, what a great ride this is, a beautiful day. And, and then you decide, let's go 56 and suddenly you've got a police escort. <laughs> and, and the crowd has doubled you and the other guy, right? And, and that's because you've gone beyond. And that's what that word transgression means. And the third word I put there for you is iniquity, which is intention to hurt or to damage, to do evil. And uh, uh, look at the scripture. I found the scripture that had all three of these words in it. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. In other words, we broke God's laws there and sin and, and sin broke the world. That the world is broken. So that's the problem. You know, that's the reason there is rebellion, as I say, against God and everything's broken. Secondly, though, what's the results of that? Now, this is it. Now, look at this. And you know this stuff. This is the damage. You know, um, when there's damage, that means that we live on a damaged planet and nothing works perfectly. And I give you six examples of that here. Six dimensions of life where sin has damaged. You know, we laugh at sin now, but, I, but I'll show you what it does. This is, uh, just, just in my studies here, you'll see this. First of all, natural disasters and deformities. Look at this scripture, Romans 8. Creation was condemned to lose its purpose. Isn't that something? That when you think about natural disasters, insurance calls it acts of God. That's what it calls it. Isn't that right? But it's certainly not God's original idea. That's what I want you to see. That's the result of it. Again, look at Scripture. Creation, another version of that same verse 20. Creation is confused. You see that? That everything on this planet has lost its original purpose. And... and Creation is confused, that we're not in Eden anymore. John Milton, paradise lost. And that's what we have, right? That our DNA, our DNA is now damaged, and, and, and it's a mess. Uh, for example, uh, health-wise, I, I had a, a doctor tell me this several years back. He's talking about diabetes, and he said, it is the scourge of the 21st century. That's interesting, isn't it? That we're still coming up with new things, or new versions of it anyway. So first of all, natural disasters and deformities. All creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. See that? Now, second result of our rebellion, look at this. Physical decay and death. Physical decay and death. Death is inevitable. We know that. That's why we have funeral home that border this property. When, when the bishop moved me here, when the bishop moved me here uh, three years ago, she said, Joe, you're really going to be happy at First Broad Street. And I said, how do you know that, bishop? She said, uh, because it's the only church in a conference that borders two funeral homes, and I know how you feel about funeral homes. I said, <laughs> that's right, bishop. Look what it says, though. Look. Look, and this is Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived. Now get a hold of this. No one can control the wind or stop his own death. That we try to delay the decay with oil of ole. Right? <laughs> we take a little of the potion and rub in the lotion and end up with Botox in our cheeks. But you know, we're still decaying. 
that we're still going down the tube. I wish I'd had some kind of display up here for that. We might have sold a few bottles. But no one can control the wind. That's what he's talking about. That uh, um, though our bodies are dying, that says we are in decline, 2 Corinthians 4. You see that? Been to a reunion lately? You know, people will walk up to you. Like when they heard I was retiring, they said, Joe, how old are you? And I said, well, I'm 39. And, and just leave it at that, you know. Uh, in other words, don't bug me with that. No. But you go to a reunion and everybody's the same age. You know that? I had a reunion, right? Last August. You remember that? The other day, the other day, Beth, we were talking and I said, Beth, and, and there was a girl in our class, my senior class, that she was on every committee and, and served every office through her four or five years in, in school there. And, and uh, uh, we'll call her Sally Lou to protect the innocent, okay? So I was talking to Beth the other day and I said, you know, Beth, we, I don't know how we got on the reunion. I said, uh, isn't it amazing that Sally Lou did not even come to the reunion. I mean, she had her nose in everything. She's on every committee. She was this, she was that, and didn't even have, didn't even have the, the, the responsibility to us to come and, and, and to grace us with her presence. And I'm really getting flowery. You know, Beth, Beth, where was she? She should have been there. And Beth said, Joe? She said, Joe, you remember when we walked in? And we're walking down the hall at the wise end and wise. We're walking down the hall, and this girl sees me, this lady. And uh, she runs. She says, Joe, Joe, Joe Green, Joe Green, you know. And, and she runs up, and, and, and it was like some movie. She grabs me, oh, Joe, you know. I might be overdoing this a little bit. But anyway, <laughs> you know. She, she grabbed me and said, oh, Joe. Beth said, do you remember that? I said, yeah, I do. She said, that was Sally Lou. <laughs> I said, that wasn't her. And, and she said, yes, it was. I said, that, that lady was sitting with my brother Eddie. He said, yes, that's her. I said, it sure didn't look like her. I believe she sent somebody in a place. Good night. <laughs> but we were all the same age, you know? But we're all decaying. That's why they have places like we have across the road there. <laughs> I'm not over the hill, but I am playing the back nine. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and and, and uh, it's all because, can you imagine? Can you imagine today? If Adam had not done that, if Adam and Eve had not sinned that day, you'd see someone young and vibrant up here. And now you just see somebody old and vibrant up here, you know? <laughs> you with me? Though our bodies are dying. 1 Corinthians 15, everyone dies because all of us are related to Adam, the first man. Wow. Isn't that something? You say, wow, Joe, would you like to stay on this planet forever? I said, no, not me. Too much, it's a mess. Too much pain, too much suffering. Someday we're all moving on. A third thing is this, a third dimension of life that is a result of sin. Emotional distress and disappointment, so true. Look at the scripture, again, Solomon. Everything under the sun is meaningless, he says. Uh, it, it's a big disappointment. He said, everything under the sun is unfulfilling, like chasing the wind. What is wrong cannot be righted. What is missing cannot be recovered. Wow. There are delays. There are difficulties. There are, there are dead ends. You know, that's what he's talking about, you know? That that dream vacation uh, in the Pacific turned out to be full of mosquitoes, and you know, it was a mess, but there were problems, there were problems, and Solomon brings that out here. This is a disappointment because this is not heaven. We live on a broken planet, and there's emotional disappointment and distress. Still glad you came today? Fourth thing is relational distance and discord. 
You know, how, how did it get so messed up? Now listen to this. Again, Solomon, I saw all the people who were mistreated here on earth. I saw their tears and that they had no one to comfort them. Why is that? Because Adam and Eve messed up. You know? We're not connected to God because of what they did. That you take two imperfect people that aren't going to uh, have a perfect relationship. Again, Scripture, Genesis 3. This is Adam and Eve in the garden. They suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they strung fig leaves together around their hips to cover themselves. And goes on and says, I was afraid, Adam says, I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Because sin makes you defensive. It makes you distant. It makes you uh, demanding in a relationship. And something was lacking. The sin had something to hide. And then five, financial and vocational difficulty. How do economics get broken? How's that work? By ignoring biblical principles. You'll, you'll hear some people say when they take up the offering, they talk about giving of the Lord's tithe and our offering. Isn't that an odd way to say that? But the Lord's tithe, it says in the scripture, the tithe is the Lord's at 10%. And beyond that is the offering. The scripture said, here's a terrible thing that I've seen in this world. Again, Solomon People save up their money for a time when they, they may need it and then lose it all in some bad deal and end up with nothing left to pass on to the children. Why is it? Because the world is broken. Broken. And then Solomon writes again in Ecclesiastes 2, I hated life because the work I did under the sun was meaningless. Meaningless to me. And he goes on, he says, I turned in despair from hard work it was not the answer to my search for satisfaction in this life. And, and you've heard it said, I climbed up the ladder of success and found that it was leaning against the wrong wall. And this fits a lot of Christians today. You know that? I, I may have told you uh, some time ago, but a friend of mine, a friend of mine who was in, uh, he was in uh, one of the churches that Beth and I uh, served, and when he was in seminary, he was working at a bookstore, a Christian bookstore, and he, and he told me that. He said, in this bookstore, they got a new book by John Ortberg, a great writer. John Ortberg wrote this book, The Life You Always Wanted. And uh, um, in that book, they, they sent this book to the uh, uh, Christian bookstore, and they sent this really nice display to put the book on. And uh, when they got it, and my friend... Our friend saw the, uh, saw the title of the book. He thought, well, why are they send that to a Christian bookstore? The life you always wanted. Why would you send that to a Christian bookstore? Aren't we living the life we always wanted? So he thought it was ridiculous, but they put up this nice display, and they put the books in it and everything. And when people came in, it was one of the first things they saw was that display and he said almost everybody that came in the store stopped to look and finger through the book, to thumb through the book a little bit. And, and it suddenly dawned on him that so many Christians today are not living the life they always wanted. And so they were looking in the book for a simple recipe. And it turned out to be a book of discipline for the Christian. As John mentioned in the beginning of our service, talking about reading through scripture, things like that. But number six, the sixth thing result is spiritual discontent and darkness. Now look at this. This is something Job says. I'm like a caravan lost in the desert searching for water. In other words, I haven't the slightest idea where I'm headed, but I know I'm thirsty, and my thirst guy can't quench my thirst. So I start looking every which way and for everything, or in every direction looking for something to quench my thirst. Ephesians 4, they refused for so long to deal with God that they've lost touch not only with God but with reality itself. You want to know how bad sin is? It put Jesus on the cross. That's how bad it is. Now imagine that. You say, Joe, you're going to leave us there? No, he came to restore what was lost. Look at the last thing I share with you. What's the solution? Here it is. And you know this. 
Now, the kids knew this when they came in a while ago. Accept Jesus Christ as my Savior, that he is the key. Jesus is the key. Jesus said in this world, you will. You will have trouble. One version says, Jesus said in this world, you'll have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. I've overcome the world. And, and uh, we forget that. I have to remind myself of, of that at times. And you say, well, how do you live in a broken world? Look again, second thing. Follow his light. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't be stumbling through the darkness because you have the light that leads to life. You, you ever been in a coal mine? You may have been in a coal mine. A few of you have. That's one dark place, isn't it? I mean, it's almost like the darkness. Can, it kind of crawls over you. It, it, it's a frightening thing almost. And, and it really brings the chill deep, you know. And uh, years ago, my dad told me a story that in the 30s, in the 30s, uh, there was a mine in Derby, Virginia, just outside of Appalachia. And uh, uh, sometimes during the year when, when the temperature gets about uh, 40 degrees or, or lower, uh, methane gas will rise up. That's why they had canaries, you know. But the methane gas will rise, and, and uh, uh, often, too often, an explosion uh, would occur, and, and still will, for that matter. But because we, we, we had that near my home several years ago, didn't we, Beth? But um, the methane gas would rise. And, and uh, they're in Derby. They're in Derby um, one day, and, and one old man had warned his son. He said, son, that mine is going to blow. And he, and he said, I'm quitting. So he quit. And his son, I met his son in the early 90s when we served in Radford, Virginia. And um, I met him in a nursing home. I heard he was a friend of my dad's. Went by to see him. And, and he told me he used to work in Derby. And I said, did you work in the mines in Derby? He said, yeah. And I, I told him about my dad. I said, my dad said, told me about the explosion there that killed 15 to 20 men. And, and what happened when that thing blew, that, that they say that, that the fire blew out of the mouth of that, uh, of that mine and, and it blew across the valley and burned the woods on the far side of the valley. And so it killed 15 or 20. And it was a horrible thing. And this old man I met up in uh, Radford, actually he's in Blacksburg where I met him, but, but uh, the old man told me, he said when, he was leaving the mine that day and when he left the mine, he turned right and got out of the the, the, the direct uh, uh, flight of that explosion, and it blew him down, but it didn't kill him, obviously. And uh, I said, do you ever hear Brownie Polly? And he said, yeah. And some of you may know Brownie Polly. Uh, he passed away uh, um, not too long ago, but I'm talking about his dad. Brownie Polly was a dentist in Big Stone Gap, and his dad was working that day in the mine. And he was away back in the mine, and when the thing blew, and it blew obviously toward the front, that it blew out, they heard it, and the mine rumbled, and everybody knew there had been an explosion, and they knew if they tried to walk out that way, they would die because of carbon dioxide. And uh, they knew that they would die. There'd be no air to breathe. And so what are we going to do? And Brownie Polly said, I believe I know a, a way out. So he took these men, I'm not sure how many there were, and, and they, they said that he stretched his neck up as high as he could get it. He wasn't a big man, but he stretched his neck up as high as he could get it, and the water that they had to walk through to get out of this, this, uh, this exit that no one knew about, uh, the, they had to walk through this, this flooded area. The water was up to his chin. They had to stretch their heads to keep from drowning, and he led these men out of the mine that day and save their lives from death and darkness because he knew the way out. Jesus is the way out. You understand that? That we live in a fallen world and we don't want to just die and, and, and not go to see him one day. He's the way out. He is the one who leads us out. If you don't know Jesus, you've got to know him. 
Because if you, don't, if you haven't heard anything I've said in the last three years, know that he is the way. He is the only way out. He would tell the disciples in John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Let us pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, that, that we know we live on a broken planet. We see uh, evidence of it uh, uh, daily, really. And uh, we are thankful that uh, you've, given us, you've given us the answer in Christ Jesus. I thank you for the witness of the people here and for what you've done and are doing in and through their lives, Father. And, and I pray you continue to enrich them in every way. And Father, I pray, that, I pray that none of us would miss the way out, the escape from that darkness and that death, that being in Christ. So speak this word to our hearts, Father, and we'll give you all praise in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing, and if you need to come and pray, we invite you to come. I'd love to pray with you, but let us sing our hearts out. John? Hymn 381, let us sing the first and fourth stanzas. One and four. Savior, like the shepherd, lead us, lead thee, thy tender care. Just feed us for our youth, thy faults prepare. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast bought us thy we are. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast bought us thy we are. Let us seek thy favor, early let us do thy will. Blessed Lord, holy Savior, with thy love our bosoms fill. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast loved us, love us still. Blessed Jesus. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Thank you.